trading on the Augustine Fuentes article, Human Niche, Human Behavior, Human Nature. Uh, we'll be looking at this article a couple times in the course. Today we read the first five pages and that will be all for now. We'll come back to it uh, when we start talking about archaeology and tool use among human beings. Um, because that's where some of this stuff gets applied. Um, so we'll, we will eventually read the rest of the article, but for now we're going to concentrate on the first part. Uh, as I said, uh, and as some of you know, this is, this is pretty difficult material. Um, so I'm not expecting us to understand every word or, you know, it uses a lot of two big words. Uh, I just want to get some of the big ideas and the main points across about how uh, Fuentes and others are trying to develop evolutionary theory, especially as it applies to human beings. So, um, I first want to talk about what is called the modern evolutionary synthesis. It's the end of the Muckle and Gonzalez uh, chapter on page 71. Uh, Charles Darwin was doing his work and was publishing. Uh, as, uh, as we heard, uh, at, in Darwin's time, they didn't have much of an idea of how traits were inherited or passed along. At the same time, uh, Gregor Mendel was working in a, in a monastery. Uh, they never met and they never, uh, as we further know, they never really read each other's work. Uh, and so, what happened is that after, after both of them had died in the 19, 1930s, 40s, and 50s, uh, basically people started to put together their work. And so the modern evolutionary synthesis uh, is also called the Neo-Darwinian paradigm. Um, it's what uh, Fuentes calls the standard evolutionary approach. So this is something that we, you know, when is probably what we most learn when it comes to our standard biology classes uh, is the idea of from Darwin of selection and especially of natural selection and from Mendel of uh, the genetics and the inheritance and putting these two ideas together uh, resulted in what we call the modern evolutionary synthesis or the neo-Darwinian, the new Darwinian uh, paradigm. Now, in recent years, perhaps in the last 10 or 20 years, uh, but maybe even uh, more recent than that, uh, Fuentes with some biologists, this is stuff that is still debated in biology, uh, is trying to uh, supplement this approach and to sort of go beyond what we might consider the modern evolutionary synthesis. So this is, this is kind of what you might consider more cutting edge material. There are still debates uh, within biology and within anthropology about whether to what extent uh, the, these new ideas should be, uh, should hold sway. Um, I feel like they're extremely important, especially when it comes to human beings. Um, but, you know, I, I recognize that there is, this is part of the, you know, science is not something that has, is fixed for all time. It is debatable and people will be, you know, arguing about this based on the evidence. So, what does Fuentes mean by the he calls this the extended evolutionary synthesis. So if we have the modern evolutionary synthesis, this is something that he wants to say is an addition or added onto or expanded beyond that. So that what, what he's after here is going beyond what he calls the selection focused standard approach. So that's what we were just talking about with natural selection. Uh, that's basically what we mostly learn about when it comes to our biology classes. So this is trying to expand beyond the selection focused standard approach to include different processes, niche construction, ecological inheritance, and multiple modes of inheritance. And so uh, later on, we're gonna talk more, uh, when we get into the archeology span section and talk about the domestication of plants and animals, we'll talk more about ecological inheritance. For this class and for what we're going to learn in, in this segment for the next exam, I just wanna concentrate on the niche construction aspect of it and what that might mean or how that modifies our evolutionary approach. So the idea of niche construction 
is uh, it's a little bit different from maybe sometimes what people think of as finding your own niche or your own space. The idea of niche construction is based on uh, several different principles. First of all, we know that as we talked about, genes are not just set for all time. They are dynamic in their environment. They get turned on and off. They get expressed differently based on how the environment uh, changes. We also know that organisms alter or change the environment. So organisms are not just sitting there in an environment and they don't do anything and the environment is all around them. Organisms are themselves active in the environment. Um, we can see this throughout nature, probably some of the big examples of how beavers modify the env environment with their dams and roadways and lodges and birds make nests and rodents make their tunnels and even algae can do different things so that the environment becomes a, quite different than the first time that this, that the creature, from before the creature was in that environment. Some of these are intentional alterations. So, you know, the beaver may not be thinking much, but has sort of an idea of what's, you know, must have some not necessarily a plan per se, but has is very intentional about altering the environment. But organisms are also unintentionally altering the environment with everything we do. So when we breathe in oxygen and breathe out CO2, we are actually modifying unintentionally the environment. We are changing that environment just a little bit. And there's a lot of things that organisms do uh, that changes the environment without they didn't maybe perhaps even want to. The key, uh, the key insight of niche construction is that the alterations that organisms make intentionally or unintentionally can result in changes for the conditions of selection for the next generation. So the environment that a young baby beaver grows up in is going to be different because of the activity of her parents in that environment. And so creatures can change the environment in such a way that then their offspring grow up in changed conditions. And that might result in changing conditions of selection processes. Now this is especially true when it comes to human beings. And so it Augustine Fuentes is describing in this article is what he calls the human niche. And this is when the words get too big, but let's go through them. So the human niche is something where humans over time tend to be very innovative. And he calls it the increased use of extrasomatic materials. Extrasomatic is outside the body. So that basically just means that we use tools to reshape our environment. And then that creates a feedback loop which alters the way the next generation is going to grow up in the world. I'm looking out today right now over the classroom that hopefully we'll be able to come back to in a week or so. And this is a very modified environment. It is nothing like what people might have experienced in this very spot 300 years ago, for example. So humans are modifying their environment. We see that especially with modern environments in which people grow up in apartment buildings and cities and things that would not have existed in earlier times. But this is a process that is going on for thousands or even hundreds of thousands or perhaps even millions of years as human beings change the conditions around them and in turn change the conditions of their own selection for the next generation. What this means is that evolution is not just a passive, you're not simply adapting to an environment. Organisms play a role, an active role in their own evolution. And so when we migrate, when an organism migrates to a new place, when an organism alters the environment, when we have different ideas about mate selection or what is called sexual selection, which is also in a, a, um, an important mechanism of evolution, perhaps not one that we learned about in high school biology, but it was one that Darwin and others 
thought about is, you know, why do certain creatures uh, have some traits? Some of them are not necessarily because of fitness, but because of sexual selection. All of these things can change the evolutionary processes, not necessarily in the way we want them to change. Some of these things go wrong or are unintentional, um, but they nevertheless result in the change in evolutionary processes. And this is what Fuentes talks about when he talks about human culture and particularly complex human life history patterns. So the reasons why humans want to marry different people or they want to build certain kinds of houses or eat certain kinds of food, all those things that we talk about as culture or learned behavior end up also modifying the conditions of evolution into the next generation. Interesting example of this that goes back to uh, what Muckle and Gonzalez talked about on page 56 is the ability to, uh, to digest lactose or what was called lactose tolerance. And so, you know, most humans for most of our evolutionary time uh, could not digest the milk of cows. Uh, you could have it for a little bit, but then you'd lose that over your lifetime. What happens is, is that in the areas in which cattle became very important for survival, people also developed genetic and other modifications so that they could tolerate lactose over time. Now, interestingly, some people think about this as a, you know, sometimes this is said to be, to, to, be a racial trait, but it's not actually a racial trait at all. It simply is that if your ancestors come from an area in which, uh, in which cattle were important, there tend to be a larger percentage of the adult populations that can drink milk. So if you're from Northern Europe, uh, that's one of those places that has high lactose tolerance. And that's probably why many people uh, in the United States were fed those silly drink milk commercials because there were high, high percentages of lactose tolerance. This is also true for people from certain parts of, um, of, of West Africa, as you can see there, also very highly dependent on cattle in certain parts of Southern Africa, but also other parts of Southern Africa were not at all uh, milk drinkers. And so um, also in Saudi Arabia and parts of uh, northern, uh, what is now northern India, are uh, definitely a high lactose tolerance, but East Asia, very low lactose tolerance. So this is an example of something that has in the last 10,000, 12,000, 15,000 years changed people's genetic and genetic and biological makeup basically based on cultural activities, on things that we do as human beings. And so it's one of those things in which we are, uh, you know, actively uh, influencing our own evolution. Do not worry though, you can modify this, but you may have seen that you can, you know, get lactose, that you can modify your milk so that you can drink it. And also people who are lactose intolerant, there's plenty of other sources of all these nutrients. So this is not, not something that makes people better or worse. It's simply an evolutionary trade-off, which happens because of culture. What this allows us to do is to rethink or reimagine the idea of a human nature. So in the early days, I think everybody thought that, you know, we were looking for these absolutes or human universals or things that everybody did that were biologically fixed. And Fuentes wants us to sort of, by thinking about these complexities, by thinking about how niche construction and other aspects of evolutionary theory, the extended evolutionary synthesis, uh, help us to rethink some of our biological assumptions, he says that what we should think of human nature as is not necessarily this thing that is you know, fixed for all time or shared by all, but as a suite of potentials. So what he means by that is a variety of things that we can, we can but are not necessarily destined to do. So that humans 
are in fact perhaps uniquely flexible because of the history that we've had. And so there is that sentence about how he's not arguing for uniquely human nature because in fact, he's arguing that we make multiple natures or multiple possibilities of potentiality because of our flexibility of our niche construction activities and because of how human culture shapes our very evolutionary process. So, like I said, this is, you know, this is sometimes a very difficult reading, but I think one of the big main points that I want you to get out of this is how Fuentes doesn't think that there's some sort of, you know, the idea that there's some sort of fixed absolute content to human nature, rather than it's a kind of uh, a, a suite of potentials. So this was something that came up on the quiz. Um, he is, he's definitely not looking for the universal elements of human nature. He really wants us to think about all the potential things that humans can be, a kind of becoming process rather than a kind of uh, fixed idea or establishment of those universal elements. So that was uh, another thing that was uh, difficult on the quiz and hopefully you can go back and take a second, second try at that if that didn't work out the first time. Questions?